There is a noon time, folks. Ted Rawson here, downtown Honolulu Studios, Think Tech Hawaii, with our show Where the Drone Leads, uh, talking about a fascinating subject, often completely bypassing most people's knowledge of drones. Of course, we have a drone here on the table because we have a show Where the Drone Leads. The guest, Dustin Hello. Telwig, uh, Hi, CTO, CEO of uh, Chesapeake Technologies, Inc., out of Colorado. CTO, you were right the first time. Okay. Good job. <laughs> no, CTO, okay. Good memory. All right. Anyway, uh, second time uh, flyer on this show, and yep. once you've been here twice, it's sort of like a, you know, it's going to happen more. So works for Especially me. Especially when you're coming out here all the time, talking to the folks uh, other side of the island here. Anyway, we're talking about spectrum, something that is something that is uh, really unknown to most people who deal in radios or Wi-Fi objects. Uh, the whole sinew that ties things together is spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. We should be specific on and that's what you guys do you guys do spectrum for a living absolutely tell us and about cti will do so uh, chesapeake technology we work in spectrum and electronic warfare and signals intelligence and those kinds of areas primarily in the defense and intelligence arena but uh, you know we all use spectrum every day we don't see it uh, every time you use your smartphone or you open the garage or, um, you know, in some cases change the channel on your TV, although that's infrared as well, you use spectrum. And it can be interfered with, it can cause disruption, uh, and especially... Oh, you could talking, cause disruption. Absolutely, if yeah. that's your intent. Um, and, uh, you know, with things like drones, a lot of them are remote controlled through RF spectrum. And so, uh, you know, as we use more of these in an urban environment or in any environment, they're likely to cause interference with each other and with the other things that we use that utilize spectrum. So we got to take special attention to that, figure out how to model it, how to understand it, how to forecast it, and how to prepare for it. And then, of course, the FCC is out there managing who owns and who has access to what spectrum, and drones are going to get their own spectra at some point in time. We don't know when. Right now, they're basically running on the unlicensed open uh, frequencies. Yes. So if we have uh, one drone per neighborhood right now, and we got people on, on their cell phones and Wi-Fi and garage doors coming up and down and this sort of thing, that's loading up that spectrum. Absolutely. If we put 500 of these in some neighborhood or 5,000, what's going to happen? Well. Uh, they may start falling. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, hopefully they would just stay in place and become inoperable. But, uh, you know, a good example, many of you may have tried to use a 2.4 gigahertz cordless phone in your house. You turn the microwave on and what happens? You hear a lot of interference and you can't talk through it. So the same thing will happen with these. You know, there's devices we use everywhere that create noise in the environment. And uh, as we load up, like you say, with more and more drone drones, they'll interfere with each other. And those normal household devices can interfere with them as well. So. You know, while we may want one of these things to deliver a package to our door from Amazon, it may become unlikely in, in highly dense urban environments unless we plan well. And so what's going to happen is if that density is, of signals is too high, the system simply can't connect the ground controller with the unit and it just won't start up, won't yep. go anywhere. Or, or, or you'd have to put more autonomy on this, but you know the computers that you can fit in there aren't very large, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things they'd have to deal with and figure out that they might not be able to in that or small computing environment. Or you'd have to put a more powerful transmitter on and try to dominate and get there before somebody Which else Which will does. just exacerbate the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Make it worse, right? <laughs> yeah, so we yeah that's situation. like saying, let's solve traffic by putting big trucks on the road. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> So we're, we're heading for something that uh, nobody's quite prepared to really think hard about. And uh, because spectrum can't be seen, somebody else takes care of it, it's a very arcane subject, it disappears from our current mentality. Yes. But you've got some techniques and tools for understanding that and forecasting and predicting? Yeah, we've developed a number of uh, mathematical capabilities, algorithmic capabilities in software that can predict you know, where that density might become problematic. Um, uh, it can monitor it in real time if you've got sensors that you can access that show you what's going on in spectrum, what's going on in the navigation space, what's going on in the communication space. Then we can show visually where problems may occur or where they are occurring and then you can deal with them. So let's take our University of Hawaii uh, unmanned air systems test range as an example. We have we use our own athletic facilities. We can use our agricultural fields. We have the entire island of Lanai available to us. So as we get into serious testing in those areas, and we need to understand what's out there in terms of spectrum utility and usage today, 
you could provide something to us that would give us that picture yeah. and make, make sure that what we do isn't going to foul somebody else up in the process. And what would be nice is to try that. Let's, let's model it, see what kind of answers we come up uh -huh. with and determine where interference might occur, and then let's go try it, maybe not in the urban area yet, but in the, you know, out in the outlying areas. Let's load up the environment with lots of these things and see if it matches the prediction. And then refine the models if we need to based on that. That's cool. I know we can actually think of what's going to happen in downtown Honolulu at some point in time when a lot of drones start showing up. They may be legal, they may be licensed and all this sort of thing, but that doesn't mean that they're properly aligned with the available spectrum. Yeah, so. and you know, buildings have lots of metal <laughs> in them, and metal tends to interfere with spectrum as well and, and inhibit its propagation. So we really have to have a good detailed uh, three-dimensional and, and even structural model of that urban environment so we can understand how spectrum so you need materials will act. And, and, and structure, orientation, and, and then that can be modeled. Mm -hmm. And so the public service people who depend on radio communication for emergency response and such, they'd be very interested in making sure they have clear access to the communications and aren't going to be uh, manhandled by the folks out there with drones and such. Absolutely. And our, our cell phone providers do a lot of that modeling now because it's very important to them, of course, to provide quality of service wherever you happen to be in the city. So, you know, they've been kind of at the forefront, I think, of doing urban RF propagation modeling. But that's one of the reasons we're interested in teaming with University of Hawaii is because you guys have a department that focuses on some of those issues. So we could actually take that existing understanding relationship and the availability of sensors that are placed up by the, by the cell network providers and start thinking about that as it rises up into the air and, and deals with, uh, with drones. Absolutely. What would it take to, what, is that a year long process or six months, a couple of well, years? Well, we have many of the tools in place to at least do the modeling and sim and some of that mm -hmm. planning aspect of it. And then, you know, you would want to get sensors deployed that are able to sense the spectrum that drones might use. Um, you know, a cell phone provider is going to look at 900 megahertz, 1800 megahertz, mm -hmm. the, the normal cell bands. Uh, with drones in 5.2 gig, we might not have sensors arrayed around the uh, city that can provide that. So that so would we have be to a, put a sensors part. in place yeah, at, at every what, half mile or something like that, or uh, wherever you know we'd want to model the city, and we we can <laughs> tell you where model. to place the sensors. Modeling yeah. and simulation runs the world, doesn't it these days? It does. It you get some uh, some uh, graphics here we can take a look at. I think so. We uh, did a short video clip of some of our software that shows uh, some potential interference areas of navigation systems uh, based on some tracking data from ships and aircraft. Um, so what you're seeing here is a multicolored heat map and the red area is kind of showing where navigation may be inhibited. So that's an area that I wouldn't want to fly a bunch of drones because they, they'll lose their sense of where they're at. Um, again, this is fake data, but it gives you a sense of the kind of live displays we can generate based on live sensor data and the modeling and sim that uh, create that picture. And that, those, those red zones were, were the calculated overload areas where there's too much activity going on based on the simulated load of navigation devices that are attempting to communicate that you put on the, in there. Yeah, and all the way down to the modeling of the, uh, the waveforms being consumed by the receiving systems in these devices. So, you know, they're experiencing lots of uh, RF energy at their aperture, and then they, they process that energy, try to retrieve the useful signals out of it, but at some point the noise becomes so high that they can't get the useful signals anymore. Okay, then at that point in time they declare I'm out of business. I give up. I yeah, give they up. Either right. Over to you, base, right. or they just hover in place, or you know, oh, hopefully or, not fall uh, out of the sky. Go in the ocean, whatever it might be. Yeah, right, you yeah, go into exactly. some kind of a default mode that is uh, perhaps not what you wanted to run your mission. Sure. In fact, that whole issue of waveform—that's something even more arcane than than the pure issue of spectrum. Yes. Uh, everything is sinusoidal these days, but. Uh, with software-defined radios, can you alter that? Can you uh, absolutely? <laughs> yeah. So. so the use of software-defined radios, where I can basically do arbitrary waveform generation, and, and I can dynamically change it, um, you know, is powerful because that's what a lot of these devices are built on. Because the the uh, FPGAs on which that's done are very small, but it's also a challenge for like our military brethren, where um, you know uh, a potential enemy is exploiting that commercially available capability to make very dynamic waveforms that are hard for to predict and interact with from, let's say, an electronic warfare system. So you can get those uh, uh, software-defined radios on the open market today. Absolutely. And you can prescribe your own waveform. Yep, just Google, you know, Xilinx <laughs> right? and FPGA, oh. <laughs> and there's plenty of them out there okay. for sure. Yeah. And uh, somehow you can program them to your satisfaction. Yes. And uh, uh, you, if you're 
a, a, that type of, type of a person, you'd want to have something as far away from a sinusoid as you can to make it less detectable by yes, a, unless it's a very strong uh, field. Of some there's kind. very complex modulation types. That's mm -hmm. a whole field in and of itself. Is just uh, developing waveforms that survive well in dense environments and uh, are unique uh, or encoded or encrypted in ways that make it so that only your system can can hear them or listen to them. Is that a, is that a possibility with, uh, again, trying to jam a lot of drones into the new spectrum that is defined by RTCA whenever that occurs, is SDR to have a lot of personalized, uh, uh, what do they call them, uh, uh, designer, uh, designer sure. waveforms. Designer waveforms. Uh, well, in fact, it, you know, DirecTV is a good example. So, you know, there's many, many subscribers on DirecTV, and there's a satellite putting a signal out, but they encode their signal with unique keys that only your DirecTV receiver can decode. And so, those kinds of coding techniques allow us to share spectrum in in, in uh, powerful ways. So, it's not always just about power level and what frequency it's in. It's how these complex waveforms mix and share. Okay, the encoding as well as the complexity of the waveform both can contribute to uh, super uh, muxing in some way here that uh, gets a lot of lot of signal on the bandwidth. So we're going to see that happening here then in these, if you're saying... It's not it's, already. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, yeah. And if it's commercially available, it'll, it'll be the next thing to happen here. That sure. makes it even more difficult for the, the guy who's trying to detect uh, malicious operations or someone who is... Uh, like our power company out there, and they, they are very happy with their six drones flying over the power lines, but they don't know who that seventh one is. What's yeah. that guy doing? Yeah. Or even a professor doing work on coastal erosion out there, and and someone who knows he's really good at that, hey, she's a second drone up there, and somebody's apparently copying my research. Right yeah, now. yeah, or it, even not even put another drone up, but uh, use <laughs> take easily signal. available RF, you know, emitting devices to interfere with his signal. Yeah. So the, the whole murky world of uh, spectrum and waveform and uh, the exploitation of all that is what you guys are right in the middle of. Yeah, and so. you know, again, it's invisible, so right. it's hard to attribute these things to specific individuals. When someone is interfering with your signal, who's doing it? Well, they could be 100 miles away with a high-powered interferer, or they could be 10 feet away with a low-powered interferer. It's very hard sometimes to discern where that interference is coming from, which is why we build these tools that allow us to model the environment to better understand where those interferers That's really occur. great. So the tools allow you to simulate, and then during training you could look at actual emitters that are engaged, and uh, you could both um, observe operations and you could design for minimum interference and design for uh, what you need in terms of antenna spacing, power, and even waveform generation in order to handle the situation that's precarious. Sure, and that's really what the spectrum management community does today. What we're trying to do is help them move into becoming spectrum operators so that not only are they planning well, yeah. but uh, when they're operating, they're able to understand where that interference is going to occur. It's unlikely that we can eliminate all of it, but how do we deal with it when it does occur? That's a really interesting and a complex situation. We don't even have an analog in the in like the road transportation system, do we? The roads are where they are. Uh, well, we kind of do with Google Maps, right? I mean, the Google Maps, we all trust it. Uh, it gives us multiple answers on how to maneuver in that road space. So we're trying to do the same kind of thing in Spectrum and in Electronic Warfare is how do I generate autonomously solutions that give me multiple options on the battlefield? Uh -huh. but, but I think you have a lot more flexibility, a lot more freedom in the, in the electronic world than we do on the structural mechanical yeah. world. And, uh, and this is, again, something we're going to have to educate the public a lot in this subject area. We're, as all of our systems are getting more and more dependent on uh, wireless communication, and as we start building up new buildings in the middle of Kaka'ako that weren't there before, then some, if you say suddenly so. something's not going to work. <laughs> right. You guys have a long career ahead of you here. So. Yeah. yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Let's talk about that after we get from our, back from our break. we Will do.
It is just afternoon, folks. Ted Rawson here at downtown Honolulu Studios of Think Tech Hawaii with our show, Where the Drone Leads. Dustin Helwig joining us for a fascinating conversation. Thanks for coming thanks, back Ted. on the show, Dustin, and uh, thanks, Jimmy, for bringing him out here. Uh, anyway, we're talking about a very hard to understand subject that we're going to all have to face, our legislatures, our educators, our students, and that is the subject of electromagnetic spectrum and the waveforms that ride therein and the values and the, and the consequences that come from perhaps somewhat of an uncontrolled uh, approach towards usage of that airspace, so to speak. Yeah, they, they do good planning today. The spectrum management yeah. community does a great job, but uh, once things start happening, it becomes a bit of a Wild West, I think. Okay, and, and unfortunately, the Wild West also describes what's going on in the world of drones. And, yes. and, uh, and what, so we have, a, we have a sort of a collision sort of coming here, don't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, that leads to a long career for you and, uh, and your company good. in terms of putting up systems that model and simulate something as complex as electromagnetic radiation from radiators and what the receivers will see, how the signal bounces off buildings, how the signal may be absorbed by the steel in a building, maybe even atmospheric effects. Absolutely. And what, what more do you have to add to your model as you, well, as you go forward here? You can get really, really, really detailed. And there are models that take hours, if not days, to run to answer one problem. But what we found is you have to be able to operate. And so humans need responses faster than that. Um, so we, we try to create uh, good enough algorithms that give us a, a good answer uh, that's a useful solution with, without having to take all that computational time. Um, in certain planning problems, it, it might be complex enough that you have to take that time and plan it out. Uh, but when you're in operations and interference is occurring, you have to respond quickly. You know, another thought on that I wouldn't, wanted to ask you. Uh, drones and such are becoming smaller and smaller as uh, power density and batteries goes up as better windings occur in the motors and such, and as uh, even radars down to you know three or four ounces these days, in mm -hmm. some cases LIDARs down to a pound and a half. As we start crunching all this stuff together, we have antennas running on top of antennas. Mm -hmm. So is there within your system a way to handle that, that is the scale factors on systems getting smaller? Yes. Um, we certainly don't focus so much on what they call the, the close-in spectrum problem, so interference on a platform itself between its multiple apertures or multiple antennas. We, we kind of deal outside of that um, close-in problem space. There are, there's a whole field called EC3 um, where that's what they do, or I'm sorry, E3, where they, they model that close-in interference space so that you can place the antennas and design the antennas uh, to avoid those problems. So there are design systems, design codes, that, and simulations that well, it will deal with that. The two of them are going to be needed as this Absolutely. miniaturization They're goes both forward. Here. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, the civil side. I mean, certainly the military is very aware because they get uh, adversely influenced by incorrect spectrum management. Mm -hmm. On the civil side, other than the, as you mentioned, the cell phone companies understand it; and it's their bread and butter that they have to have it. But the to our fire departments and police departments and uh, emergency management people, do you think there's an adequate understanding? of what the potential risks might be and how those risks might be addressed out there? Hard to say. Probably depends on the specific department. I wouldn't want to put every, all of our first responders down across the country. Um, but it is a challenging field, and I think some of them have probably been exposed to those problems, especially if they were in the military, so they understand it. Everyone understands when they go behind this you know, certain building, they lose radio contact, so they, what do they do? They just don't go behind that building, right? But what if they need to go by that, behind that building? You know, how do, we, how do we help them still succeed? And something like a drone could help. You could hover the drone at the corner of the building and it's doing a radio relay operation back into that dark space, you know, where they need to operate. So there, there's lots of uh, potential solutions there uh, to provide dynamic coverage where it's needed. We certainly have that problem here with the high mountains, the Koala Mountains that separate the islands. In fact, uh, uh, growing up here, our, on the windward side of this island, our television feed came from the island of Maui. And uh, I think our first responder uh, community has a lot of that going on with uh, yeah. a lot of, trans a lot of uh, signal propagation issues that the mountains bring up. Yeah, I'm sure there's so, a mountain peak somewhere around here that has lots of antennas on it that are just radio repeaters <laughs> yeah. between the sides. And you're yeah. suggesting a radio repeater could be a small one, could be whether at low, frequent, low power, uh, low range, but that's good enough for yep. an urban environment or even a search and rescue environment up in the complex mountains. There's one the thing drone. we can't solve, 
It's the physics problem of wavelength, which is, you know, a descriptor of RF energy. And wavelength is keyed to the size of the antenna. And I think right. you were pointing one out here earlier. You Just know, to show uh, that. That's a dipole antenna for yeah. 2.4 megahertz. A small antenna is for higher frequencies. So the higher the frequency, the long, the shorter the wavelength, and therefore a 2.4 gig uh, antenna can be very small. If you get down into 300 megahertz, that's where you start seeing longer whip antennas, you know, in, in, into HF frequencies, which propagate very far, but you need a 50-foot antenna to be able to receive them. So there's a limitation to the miniaturization. It's going to have to stay in the, in the ultra-high frequencies in order to keep the physical dimensions from yes. becoming a problem. But on the, on the yeah. negative side of that, those frequencies don't propagate as well. So they're easier to uh, absorb and interfere with, and they don't go as far without more power. So therefore, you have a, a better operating environment in, in that regard. Yeah, and you'll see the military has picked certain frequency ranges to best enable them to communicate on the battlefield. So they need you know, good propagation distance without too much power. And, and so as we lose these frequencies, as they get sold off by the government to commercial industry, which is good, it's a revenue generator, the military is having to understand how to deal with that. Uh, and there's a, 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 a thing called the National Spectrum Consortium that's actually been stood up to help develop technologies to solve those problems. Is that part of the Department of Commerce, right alongside RTCA? I think NTIA is part of the Department NTIA of Commerce. NTIA is part of the, the OC. The NSC right. is a, uh, it's called an Other Transaction Agreement Consortium. So it's kind of like, uh, if you're familiar with uh, DIUX or Softworks, these rapid acquisition conduits, the NSC is, is something similar to that to get capability developed fast. You know, the background and experience you guys have, work, your company has working uh, in these complex battlefield environments with the military is really useful as the drone community starts to generate its pulling together its standards. The drone community, these systems are going to have to be uh, self-certified. The FAA is not going to generate regulations. They're saying, uh, you guys go sort it out yourself, best practices, inherit them from wherever you can, make them mm -hmm. correct, and then adhere to them. And if you stay within the bounds, color within the lines, and don't cause problems, well, let you go that way. Uh, if you don't do that, we'll come in and be glad to manage you. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll have all the regulations we're familiar with on airplanes. So right now, the industry is attempting to gather itself together, the search and rescue people, the post-disaster of building inspection people, the insurance, you know, all the way from the user, mm -hmm. all the way to the trusted uh, chip designer uh, on a, in a trusted software system, like uh, uh, folks dealing with uh, uh, multi-level security and such. So the, the whole gamut from calculation to physics is all up for uh, having standards associated with it being put together. And your, and your knowledge ought to be in the middle of that. So there's a, uh, I'm actually a member of a subcommittee. I probably don't attend the meetings as much as I should, <laughs> so I apologize to the IEEE brethren out there, but uh, IEEE 1900.5.2 has developed a model called the Spectrum Consumption Model. Uh, and they're pushing that forward as a, a standard a descriptor of what they call spectrum consumption, which is transmitting or receiving, actually. Um, and so we're working some programs with organizations like DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, to leverage those standards to describe this complex modeling in highly scaled up dense environments. And, and how do we manage that and how do we command and control in that kind of environment? So that, that basis that you got, you could offer it to the uh, to the, or the growing organizations that sure. are coming together here. And like I said, I don't need to. It's already an IEEE project. So they, they, they certainly have it out there. Uh, and, um, you know, IEEE is a great organization for pushing standards forward. That's great. So, uh, and, and that, that really also means that basically all the things we have today that are drone are going to be cycling through some major uh, conversion here, and, and so what we have is going to kind of disappear and something get, get replaced by a whole new family that probably has in it different performance standards, uh, certainly has in it different uh, fire safety and, and structural aspects and uh, operating and system reliability and spectrum management. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, today, like you said earlier, most of them leverage unlicensed frequency bands. Uh, which is, you know, definitely Wild West. You know, the government basically says in, in this frequency range, do whatever you want as long as you're below this certain power level. Um, as we aggregate the drones, even though each individual one may be, uh, you know, below that unlicensed power level, as we aggregate them, they'll start interfering more, and we, we got to figure out what to do with that. Okay, and we would like to uh, uh, increase our relationship with you and at University of Hawaii in terms of our test range and the aspects that stream off from that, including reaching down to the to the 
STEM programs in the high schools and such. And we got the uh, PCAT conference going on this week. I'll be reaching there tomorrow and I'm absolutely, absolutely going to bring this story to that, uh, to that table. Great. And we funded so. a, a STEM scholarship with University of Hawaii through the Association Great. of Old Crows this past year. And so we, we certainly are supportive of STEM. If we can't get the students excited in our domain, then you know we'll have a brain drain and old guys like me will disappear and we won't have anybody take our place. <laughs> I'm older and I'm disappearing also. But actually, we got to get them by the time they're in seventh that. grade, right? <laughs> Absolutely. If you don't get them by the time they're in seventh grade, they're going to disappear off. In fact, part of my talk tomorrow is going to be interesting. I'm going to thank the teachers I had in seventh grade there you for go. The, what they did for me. And uh, a lot of them didn't do anything for me, but uh, we survived each other, I guess. But there were a few that were really significant in helping uh, understand that. But you have really uh, certainly helped me a lot, and I hope our audience, in terms of understanding what this totally arcane subject called spectrum is all about, the thing you can't see, but it's the thing that most keeps everything working together these days. Absolutely. So, Dustin, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, again. Ed, Next time you're out here, we'll get you on again. Absolutely. Okay. We'll see you next Thursday, folks.